Amen. Well, last year we had a vision, and that vision was to reach 5 million people with the gospel message by the end of 2021. And it was kind of like one of those visions that was like an impossible vision. I didn't really know how we were going to do it, um, but we kind of cast out there and we prayed into it. And then all of a sudden we started to put videos out and put them in different parts of the world. And people in their hundreds of thousands started to watch them. And so by literally by the summer or coming to the close of summer, we had almost reached five million people with the gospel message. And by the gospel message, I mean repentance and salvation in Christ through his death, burial and resurrection. I mean the real message, not just sermons, but the actual gospel message that can save a soul from hell. We reached five million people in 2021. Now, 2022 is a whole new ball game, right? A whole new year, a whole new time to have vision. And this year, we want to reach double that. With the grace and the power of God and provision of God, we want to reach 10 million people. Can I hear an amen? amen. And we want the influence of the gospel to spread more and more and more. And as we mentioned earlier on Wednesdays, we go into the city center and we hand out these gospel tracks that we've had designed and created. And literally every single week, how many would you say between hundreds of people yeah. are receiving the gospel as we go on out? So if you're free Wednesday afternoon, please do come and join us. We have lots of opportunities to talk to people, sometimes even to pray with people. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's so exciting. And as a church, you know, 12 men changed the world. And we've got way more than 12 people in here, right? And if you've got 12 people filled with the Holy Spirit, they can absolutely shake the planet. Now, if we are a church who are filled with the Holy Spirit, we can absolutely shake Gloucestershire, right? This little county of ours, we can shake it. And we've got other plans and visions for this year as well. Like um, uh, Patricia was talking about Wales. We've got a heart and a vision this year to go into Wales and to start preaching the gospel and to travel around the counties on the outskirts of Gloucestershire. We want to share the gospel and the reasonable faith apologetics ministry and message with, uh, with the churches around there too. So please pray for that. We have got so much planned, so much going on, and um, it's making my head spin a little bit, but God's in control, amen? amen? Today's sermon title is Pick Yourself Up, Brush Yourself Off, and Try Again. How many of you have ever failed in life? Yeah. Put your hands if you failed more than once. <laughs> We've all failed, and there's nothing wrong with failure so long as we learn from our mistakes. When I was in my late teenage years, you see, I came to faith in Christ at the age of 16. At about the age of 18, 19, I was involved in this small church. And there's probably only about seven or eight people that went to this church. And this church wanted to put on an event that would kind of bring all the people in to come and hear about Jesus. And so they discovered that the lead singer, how many of you know the band Herman's Hermits? Three of you, okay, okay. So my mum and dad used to love Herman's Hermits, okay? And, and the lead singer of Herman's Hermits, he became a born-again Christian. And he, I think he was living up in Sunderland at the time, and he had his own band, very professional singer. Herman's Hermits were very, very big in their day. Um, and so this, this, this leader of this group said, we're going to kind of pay for him to come down from Sunderland with his band, and we're going to hire out Crip School Hall. How many of you have ever been to Crip School Hall? It's a big hall, right? You can fit how many in there? About a thousand people. It's huge. It's a big, big, big school hall. And so we hired the school hall. He invited this singer to come down. We paid him good money to come down. And he traveled all the way down from Sunderland with his band to come and put on a concert at the Crip School where we would share the gospel message. The only trouble was this minister didn't believe in advertising. <laughs> you know what's coming next. He said, no, 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 we don't need to advertise. We're just going to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. We're just going to pray and God will bring the people in. And even at a young age, I could see in the Bible that Jesus advertised a lot. I mean, he sent his disciples two by two into every village ahead of him, telling the village that Jesus was coming. Right. So Jesus used marketing and advertising in his day. In fact, the entire Old Testament 
is marketing and advertising proclaiming that the Messiah is on his way. Here's the place, here's the date, get ready for it, okay? So Jesus used advertising. Whitfield and Wesley, they used massive, massive advertising to draw their huge crowds. Evan Roberts used massive amounts of advertising to get the Welsh revival going. In fact, every movement, powerful movement, Billy Graham, name it, they all used or are using massive amounts of advertising. But this minister had read a few books about revival, and it's kind of the popular type of book, so that they don't give you all the information. And he just said, now we're just going to pray. We're going to believe for God. And I'm like, are you sure? Because, you know, in the Bible, like it says that how can anyone hear unless somebody goes and tells them? He's like, no, 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 the power of God, the power of God. Hyper charismatic, that sort, you know. Oh, the evening came. It's like all hundreds of chairs are put out. The lead singer from Herman's Hermits is in the hall. He is set up just like this unbelievable array of speakers and microphones and guitars and drums. And it, is, it is looking good. And then the time comes for people to arrive. And with all the prayer that had been going on, nobody turned up. It was humiliating. And what was even worse? I mean, fair play to the guy. He performed the whole set to like 10 of us. It was humiliating. You had this massive hall that fit like a thousand people. There were 10 of us sat in the front row, just kind of looking at each other. And the pastor was sat there kind of twiddling the sums, feeling really awkward about this. And that was just a huge, huge failure. It was a huge, huge mistake. And I think from that moment onwards, he realized that you have to pray and advertise. Well, about 10 years later, I had a friend who was living in Stroud. And he wanted to invite, I think it was the Christian band Fatfish. Who's heard, heard of Fatfish before? He was going to invite this band Fatfish to come along to this leisure center in Stroud. And he said exactly the same thing to me. He said, I'm putting on this event. I'm going to get all these youth to come along, but I'm not going to advertise it. I'm just going to pray and rely upon the Holy Spirit. And I was like, whoa, 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 stop. I said, you need to tell people. People aren't just going to miraculously hear about this event. If you don't tell people, you have to tell people. And he's like, no, 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 the power of God, the power of God, I'm just going to pray. And guess what happened? Fatfish turned up, he turned up, his team turned up, nobody else turned up. It was another massive failure. You see, he wasn't willing to learn from my mistakes. And the thing is, when you read the Bible, you read about imperfect men and imperfect women, and they're constantly making mistakes, but God still uses them. And the most important thing is not that we make mistakes because we're all going to make mistakes in ministry. Oh boy, I must have made like a hundred mistakes last year in ministry. The important thing is, is that we learn from our mistakes. We grow and we develop and we learn lessons because God is with us. How many of you know that? But there are principles outlaid in the word of God that we have to learn, we have to consider, and we have to develop in ourselves and in our ministries to be successful. Now, there's this guy in the Bible. I absolutely love him and I can relate to him so much. His name's the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter is just the prime example of somebody who tries so hard, but he just keeps on failing. But the great thing about Peter is that God still used him. If you've got your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. And it says this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, be brave. It is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, 
Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Here's Peter. Jesus is walking on the water. You know, Peter, he's always the first to speak up, isn't he? He's always the first to want to try something. But then again, he's always the first to fail too. But the great thing about Peter is no matter how many times he failed, he kept on trying. You know, when you fall down, you've got to pick yourself back up, brush yourself down and try again. Don't ever quit. Don't ever be one of these quitters. Well, I tried it once, Pastor. It didn't work. So that's it. I'm never going to do that again. No, no, no. If you're going to be successful, you have to try and try and try again, even though you may fail a million times. Pick yourself up, brush yourself down and try again. Learn from your mistakes. Now, the question is, what was Jesus actually trying to do here? Why was Jesus walking on the waves? Now, the answer to that question can be found in the book of Job, chapter 9, verses 4 to 8. And the book of Job says this about God, the Almighty. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone, everyone say he alone. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads upon the waves of the sea. You see, the reason Jesus went out to the disciples walking upon the waves of the sea was because he was saying to them, not with language, but by example, guess who I am. Only God alone can walk upon the waves of the sea. And here I am walking out to you upon the waves of the sea. You see, the disciples should have got it right there and right then. And the apostle Peter was the first to pipe up. Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you. Now, why was Peter responding like this? Well, he was responding like this because he was a good Jew. And Jewish people understand that if you're a disciple of a rabbi, your whole goal in life is to become just like your rabbi. How many disciples of Jesus do we have in this place today? Good. How many of you know what God's will is for you? It is to become just like your rabbi. That's God's goal for your life, to become just like Jesus. And that's why Peter piped up. You see, mariners in those days, sailors in in those days, they had a legend. And the legend was, if you're about to drown at sea, the spirit of death would come to you walking upon the waves to drag your soul down to the nether regions, down to Sheol. And this is why they were so terrified when they said, it's a ghost, it's a spirit. They thought they were going to drown because of the storm that was breaking out around them. But Jesus said, don't be afraid. It's not a spirit of death. It's me, the giver of life. And so Peter sees the giver of life. And he says to him, Rabbi, I want to be just like you. So Jesus, if it is you, command me to come out upon the waves. Because if you can walk upon the waves, I should be able to walk upon the waves. You're my rabbi. I'm your disciple. Command me, Lord. And Peter steps out. And we're actually told he walks upon the waves of the sea. Peter does something here that only God is supposed to be able to do. Think that through. How incredible is that? Peter does a God-sized miracle. I mean, Peter doesn't just step out and go splosh straight. He's literally walking upon the waves. But when he gets his attention off of Jesus and he focuses upon the, the, the winds and the waves and the storm breaking out around him, when he gets his eyes off of his rabbi and focuses on the storms, he begins to blop, 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 blop. And that's always the tactic of the enemy, Satan. He knows so long as you stay focused on Jesus, nothing can stop you. Nothing can get in your way. I mean, maybe you make a mistake here and there, but God will work all things together for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Amen. So even if you, you know, you make a mistake, even if you make a, you know, you you make a massive blunder, 
pick yourself up, brush yourself off and try again. But the enemy wants to get you distracted. He wants you to focus upon the storms in your life. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a, a, a bad bank report. Maybe it's your children misbehaving at school. I don't know, whatever it is. The enemy wants to get your attention and focus off of your rabbi and onto the storms of life. And the moment we do that, that's the moment we begin to plop, 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 plop. Even if you're having struggles in your life right now, and we all have struggles, we all have storms. In fact, most of us have a fair amount of storms, right? If we're human, we have a fair amount of storms. Satan brings storms our way all the time. And if you're really struggling in the storm right now, it's because somehow the enemy has got your focus off of Jesus Amen. and he's got you fixed upon the storms. And that's why you're going under. But the great thing about Jesus is when you make a mistake, do you know what you have to say? Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus is there with his hand, ready to lift you back out of your storm, get your focus back on him, get you into the boat of life and on your way you go again. Peter, he was a trier. He liked to give things a go. He was a little bit hot-headed. He rushed in often without thinking, but he tried things. He took risks. And this year as a church, we need to take risks. Can I hear an amen? amen. We need to just try stuff. And if we fail, so what? We encourage each other. As long as we stay focused on Jesus, it's all that matters. Yeah. Remember, the apostle Peter was the one that God revealed to him the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus turned around to Peter and said, you know, man has not revealed this to you, Peter. This has been revealed to you by my heavenly father. You see, Peter was chosen by the almighty father in heaven to understand who Jesus was. And a few short verses later, Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem where we're going to die. And Peter's like, hang on a minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm God's boy in this. I'm going, to t I'm going to tell Jesus off. I'm going to tell Jesus what he can and can't do. Jesus, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. Jesus, you're not going to die. And Jesus turns around to him and says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Here's Peter. One minute God the Father has given them this tremendous revelation of Jesus and the next minute Jesus is calling him Satan because he's allowing the enemy to use him. And this is who Peter was. One minute Peter was up, next minute Peter was down. One minute Peter was up, next minute Peter's down. On the day of Pentecost, who was it that won 3,000 people to the Lord? Peter. Who was it a little bit later on who was really racist and set himself apart from the Gentiles to hang around with the Jews only? Peter. Okay, so Peter was this, this man who made mistake after mistake after mistake, but who was it that God put in charge of the Jerusalem church? Peter. You see, God doesn't expect us to be perfect before he can use us. You don't have to be perfect before God can use you. And if you're not perfect, it means you are going to make mistakes, just like Peter made massive mistakes. But we have to learn from our mistakes. We have to get our eyes off of the storm. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we need to become like him because he is for us. And you know, sometimes we make a mistake and we beat ourselves up about it and the devil beats us up, beats us up about it. But you've got to understand God is not going to beat you up about your mistake. Yes, we may need to repent. Yes, we may need to get right with God. But God is there very quickly to reach out his hand and to lift us up out of the mire. Never forget this one thing. God loves you and God is for you. God loves you and God is for you. It's okay if you make a few mistakes along the way. How many of you love KFC? <laughs> KFC is awesome, isn't it? Some of you know the story of Colonel Sanders because I've shared this before, but many of you may not know the story of Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders was a born again, spirit filled Christian. How many of you knew that? That's why it's good to eat KFC and not McDonald's. Because oh. Ray Kroc of McDonald's, I don't think he was saved, but Colonel Sanders was saved, so it's a, it's a holy, holy food, holy chicken. But Colonel Sanders, I mean, throughout his life, he had had various jobs, he'd run little restaurants here and there, but he wasn't very successful. And when he reached the age of 65, he, put, he got his first social security check in the post. And he looked at it, and he was just so discouraged. He said, is this all I'm worth? Is this all I've amounted to? And he had nothing. He had a little house and a, a beat up old car. And he had a chicken recipe that friends and family really loved. 
And he thought to himself, what if I sell this chicken recipe to someone? Maybe they'll buy it from me. Maybe I can make money selling this chicken recipe. And so he took the little chicken recipe that he had, 11 herbs and spices. He jumped into his beat up car and he drove to the very first restaurant he could find. And he knocked on the door and he went, and they opened the door, said, hello, sir, how can we help you? And there he was in his fine white suit and his black bow tie, that weird kind of bow tie thing that he wears. And he stood there and said, hey, I've got this chicken recipe that a lot of people really, really like, and I wanna give it to you. I don't wanna sell it to you, I wanna give it to you. But for every piece of chicken that you sell, I want a percentage of the profits. And do you know what that, that restaurant owner said? Your brains are fried, get out of here. And he slammed the door in Colonel Sanders' face. Well, Colonel Sanders, a little bit discouraged, jumped into his car and went to the next restaurant. Knocked on the door, the man came to the door. Hi, how can I help you? And Colonel Sanders gave him the same spiel. I'm not gonna sell you this chicken recipe. I'm gonna give it to you, but I want a percentage of all the profits that you make selling this chicken. The door was slammed in his face. A hundred restaurants later, a hundred failures later, he's knocking on the door and they're slamming the door in his face. This is KFC, guys. Five hundred restaurants later, 500 failures later, he's knocking on the door and they're slamming the door in his face. 1,000 restaurants later, he's knocking on the door, he's offering them his chicken recipe and they're slamming the door in his face. 1,008 restaurants later, he knocks on the door, probably a little bit tired out by now battle-hardened from all the rejections. I've got this chicken recipe. Lots of people love it. I don't want to sell it to you. I'm going to give it to you, but I want a percentage of all the profits you make upon this chicken. And the restaurant owner looked at him and said, I'll give you a trial run. And at that moment, KFC was born. And now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. <laughs> Mainly funded by us. <laughs> now, the moral of the story is, look, he failed, and he failed, and he failed. And maybe his approach wasn't quite right. Maybe he was a little bit bold and abrupt to begin with. Maybe he had to learn a few lessons upon the way, but I tell you something he learned, and God taught him this, persistence. You may have a great idea. You may have a great vision. You may have a great idea for a ministry, and you try it once, and it doesn't work. You're like, well, God's obviously not in that. Don't be so sure. Sometimes God might have to take you to the hundredth time, the five hundredth time, the thousandth time, the one thousand and eighth time before your ministry launches and explodes. I mean, this year, I want you to get a vision for yourself. I mean, what is your gifting? By now, everyone in this place should know what their gifting and calling is. We know it's to be like Jesus. We know we have specific gifts in our life. So maybe get a vision for yourself. Maybe say to yourself, this year, I'm going to lead five people to Jesus Christ. That's a pretty noble vision, right? I'm going to learn how to evangelize, and I'm going to lead five people to Jesus. This year, I'm going to bring 10 people to the church. I'm going to bring them to the journey night. I'm going to bring them to Sunday morning. I'm going to bring them to prayer meeting. 10 people, and write their names down, and pray for them, and invite them, and keep on inviting them until they come. Maybe this year, you've got a burning desire to write a song. Maybe you've never written a song before, but this year is going to be the year that you write your very first song. Have a vision for that. Maybe this year it's to write a tract or a small book. You know, my sister and my wife have been pestering me for years to write books. Just pestering. You should be writing books. Your Bible studies are really good. You should be just putting it into book format. And I tried, and for years I tried writing books. I got to the first chapter and I got halfway through and I got bored. I just like, I've got no inspiration to write a book. I'm doing it because my wife and my sister thinks I should write books. And I just got no passion to do this. But last year when COVID hit, all of a sudden I got this really weird passion to start writing books. And it's not something I kind of worked up. It's something that God gave me. And last year I wrote three books and published them. And this year I want to write some more too. But, you know, you may try things and it may not work at first, but you've got to keep on trying. You've got to keep on persisting and asking God to give you the, the ability and the grace to do these things. 
So maybe it is to write your own gospel tract, get it printed, a small book. Maybe it's to start a group in the church, maybe a home group or something. I mean, we've been encouraging people to pray three times a day. Maybe you started doing that well and then after a few days, it's kind of like, well, that's kind of difficult. So I forgot breakfast and I forgot lunch and the evening's okay. And maybe you struggle with that. Maybe this year, challenge yourself. I'm going to try and pray three times a day, just like the Jewish people did. And if you fail and you fall, do you know what you're supposed to do? Pick yourself up, brush yourself off, try again. Ask God for more grace. Pray more this year. Maybe it's to memorize a book of the Bible. Don't start with Isaiah, that's too big. Start with a small book like the book of Jude. Maybe a book with like one chapter. Maybe this year you're going to say, right, I'm going to memorize the entire book of the Bible. I'm going to start every single day with just a few verses. I'm going to go over them and over them and over them until I know the scriptures. Maybe this year, get a vision to start discipling somebody. You know, it's not, I mean, obviously it's my role to disciple Christians, but it's also your role too. We're all priests. There's no such thing as clergy and laity. There's no such thing as somebody special who leads a church and everyone else isn't so special. We're all special to God. Amen. He died for every single one of us. Every single one of us is a priest. There are no high priests in the church. There's only one high priest and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're all on the same level playing field when it comes to ministry. Maybe this year, start discipling somebody, draw alongside somebody, perhaps doesn't know God yet. Start teaching them the scriptures. I love what Robbie does. Robbie often just sends out scripture verses to people. Just sends it out. Boom, boom, boom. Text, 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 text. And many people over the years, many people just reject it. They kind of wipe it off their phone. But Rob, you've seen people come to Jesus, right? Just keep on sending scripture verses. Keep sending scripture verses. And I'm sure most of us have a mobile phone. Most of us have Facebook. Most of us have YouTube or Twitter or Parler or whatever the latest thing is. I don't know. It exists. Um... (laughs) Use it. Never before in the history of humanity have we ever had as a church the opportunity to reach so many people so easily. So design something, write something, maybe a poem, a song, a gospel tract, publish it, put it out there, record yourself on on your camera, make a movie of you sharing the gospel, put it out to all of your friends and family. This year, get a vision for your life. Don't just go through this year just being a church attender. That's not fun for you, it's not fun for us, and it's not fun for Jesus. This year, God is calling you to something higher, something bigger, something more profound, more exciting, more, oh, so exciting. It's amazing. When you do something for God, when you share your faith, when you see somebody turn to Jesus, when you disciple somebody and you see the light go on, when they finally understand what justification is or sanctification, when you see the light go on, it makes you feel so amazing. It's like God has used me to change their life. So get a vision for yourself this year. Remember, God is with you. God is for you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will work all things together for the good of those who love him and accord according to his purpose. And if you make a mistake, if you fail, if you fall, pick yourself up, brush yourself down and try again. Because God is with us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.